Hey, what's up you guys, it's Connor, and today I'm going to be wrapping up the last books that I read in 2019. In this video, we will be talking about book 71 through 78. I finished the year at 78 books, which is less than the previous two years for me. In 2018, I think I read 120-something books slash comics slash graphic novels, so this year I definitely <laughs> did not do as well as previous years, but that's totally fine. I had a lot of stuff going on. If you guys have missed any of the other parts this year, I will leave them all linked down in the description as a playlist, so you can check them out if you want to. And if you guys don't know, these are the videos where I do short miniature miniature <laughs> reviews of all the most recent books that I've read. So let's just wrap up the last books of 2019 and get on to 2020. The 71st book that I read in 2019 is Skyward by Brandon Sanderson. This is the first book in a YA science fiction series by him. It follows a girl named Spencer on the planet that they're living on. They have to live underground. They have to live in these different warrens and they were once a very separated group of people. They had different clans and they were spread underneath the surface of the planet very widely. <laughs> recently or more recently they have all started to come back together and form this one society. So this society has a lot of different cultures involved in it. The reason why all these people have to live underground is that there is a group of aliens that consistently attack them and make them go back underground. The society has formed a defense force and they repel the alien attacks so that this group of people can stay together, really. Anyway, it follows this girl named Spensa. She is the daughter of someone who was in the DDF. At the beginning of the book, still, you find out that her father was killed while he was fleeing a battle, so she has been labeled the daughter of a coward, and in this society, being a coward is just the worst thing that you could be called. And despite all of that happening, Spencer still wants to join the DDF. She wants to prove that she is not a coward, and she wants to prove her father's innocence, and really, <laughs> get started from there. This is a book that is very similar to books where it's a boy and his dragon, but in this book, Brandon Sanderson decided that he wanted it to be a girl and her spaceship. So instead of a dragon, there's a spaceship that has a very quirky personality, and Spencer herself is a bit of an odd one. She's very intense, and that's addressed in this book why she is so intense. I actually did an individual review for this, so I will leave that up at the card symbol if you want to check it out, but I did end up really enjoying this. There were a couple of things that I didn't love as much. I was hoping that there would be a little more depth to some of the side characters, but there's still plenty of time throughout the rest of the series. It's just that this book is quite chunky, so I thought that there was some room that some of the other characters would have gotten better development, I guess. But I did really enjoy a lot of what we got in this book. We get to learn a lot about the culture that she's in. I wish there was more on that, but there's still plenty of time in the series to learn more about the culture. I really enjoyed the DDF and learning about how that all functioned. I really enjoyed Doom Slug, which is this little slug that she meets, as well as Embot, which is the name of her spaceship. And I just thought it was like a ton of fun. It was just a very enjoyable read for me, and I think I gave it four stars. Again, if you want to know more of my individual thoughts on this, check out that review. I'm sweating already. After that, I read Solus by Gail Carriger. This is the first book in the... ooh... Parasol Protectorate series, I believe is what it's called. This follows a woman named Alexia Terabody. She is what is called soulless, which is an offensive term for someone of her status in the paranormal world. This is a paranormal series that is based in Victorian times, I believe. So it's a bit historical, it's a bit fantasy paranormal, it's a bit of a mystery situation, so it's got a lot of different elements, but I do think that they all work together really well. It's also a fantasy of manners or of manners book. Basically, when Alexia comes into contact with another supernatural being, she takes away their extra soul. So paranormal creatures and beings have more soul than a normal human, and she is able to take those abilities away, so she's quite devastating to ghosts, specifically. <laughs> At the beginning of the book, she's attacked by a vampire, and because she's soulless, she takes away the vampire's abilities, and then it causes all of these different situations that Alexia has gotten herself into. She gets involved with this investigation of what is going on, and she also has a bit of a romance with another character in the book. I thought that this was so funny. I really did not know what to expect. A lot of my friends have enjoyed this in the past, and I didn't know if I would like it or not, because I'm not a huge fan of romance in books, but I do think that this was really fun. I thought that Alexia was so funny. She has such a dry and smart sense of humor. I really liked her interactions with the different characters. I just thought it was, I don't know, I had a really good time. I really liked learning about the society. I really liked learning about how Alexia balances the two parts of her life because she is from an all-human family that doesn't know that she's soulless, and a lot of other people in the book 
and by people I mean like creatures and stuff, don't know that soulless people even exist. It's a really fun dynamic. I thought that she played off with the other characters really well. I thought that it was just really easy to get through, so it's definitely a quicker read. And I enjoyed the mystery and finding out what was happening with these different vampires and the maneuverings of all these different paranormal groups, so I had a blast and I gave it four stars. I will say that it is adult, so if you're a younger reader, maybe wait a little while, because there is some sexy times towards the end of the book, but if that's not going to bother you, or if you're looking for that, then, you know, make a judgment call based off that. <laughs> After that, I read Poison Jungle by Tui T. Sutherland. This is the 13th book in the Wings of Fire series. This is a middle grade series, but it is in that phase where middle grade series transition into more YA series because the characters are getting a little older. They're starting to explore other things than just, whoa, <laughs> the world is not how I thought it was kind of situation. Because this is so far along in the series, it's difficult to talk about. This series is separated into different arcs, so there are five books in each arc. The first set of books, the first five books follows one problem, the second five follow a different one, now we're in a different problem. The first one follows a prophecy where these dragonets are going to end a war. There is this huge war going on where there are three sisters that are fighting over the queendom of this, the Sand Queendom. The characters that we follow in that first set of five books are the characters that are going to decide which Sandwing which is a type of dragon, is going to become the next queen of the Sandwings. In the second book, we follow characters that are somewhat related to the first set of characters. In this set of five books, books 11 through 15, there are some characters that come in from the previous books, but it's mostly a new cast because it's set on a different continent within the same world. I'm making this sound super complicated. It really is not. Really, there's just a lot of different types of dragons and there are a lot of problems in this world. We follow a character named Sundew in this book and we explore her home area. The, she is from the Poison Jungle, which is this jungle that has a lot of carnivorous plants that will kill you <laughs> if you make a mistake. In this book, the conflict of this arc is really starting to unfold, and you start to learn a lot more about what is actually going on between these different groups of dragons. I will say that this one wasn't my favorite of the series. I gave this one four stars, I believe, because I liked the other two in this arc better. I think that the character that we followed, Sundu, is a very sarcastic, very acerbic character, and I really loved her for that. She has a relationship with another female dragon, which, wonderful to see, really liked that, but when that other dragon comes into the picture, she completely changes like that, and it's difficult to, I don't know, see that transition. Like, she just changes so rapidly that it was hard to think of this new Sundew as the Sundew that we've been following in the past two plus however much time before that character comes in books. As I said, there's also some characters from the first couple of arcs of the series that come into this, and they also didn't feel completely like they were before. So yeah, this one just wasn't my favorite. Still very, very enjoyable. I really liked learning about these different dragons and their powers and everything like that. Still absolutely loving the series. Will be continuing because I am invested. 13 books in, going strong. But as I said, my least favorite of this arc so far, four stars, Moving on. After that, I listened to the audiobook for Crenshaw by Catherine Applegate. This is a standalone middle grade aged novel that follows a boy named Jackson. In this book, he's dealing with a lot of personal issues. He's also dealing with a lot of familial issues. He feels very alone. He feels different than his peers. His family has experienced homelessness and it looks like they are potentially going to be experiencing homelessness again. The whole reason the book is called Crenshaw is that Jackson has this imaginary friend who is an enormous cat named Crenshaw and he talks to this cat. It causes problems because people don't usually talk to non-existent giant cats on an everyday basis. Just based off the premise you know that it's going to be a, a kind of sad novel. I didn't expect it to be as sad as it is. It's very heavy. It feels very heavy when you're reading it. Not overly heavy, I mean the book is meant for younger readers, but I didn't expect it to be as bleak, I guess, as it is. Homelessness is a super tough topic, especially homelessness with children, so I think that it does handle that situation respectfully, and I did end up really enjoying this. There were a couple of things, though, that I didn't love as much. I thought that this book focused a lot more on 
Jackson in the past rather than Jackson in the present, and I was more interested in what was happening to Jackson today in the present when Crenshaw starts popping back into his life and his family dynamic is struggling and what what is going to happen, all of that. That tension held more of my attention than learning more about his past, which is very weird for me because usually I love people's backstories and characters' backstories and stuff, but I thought that we were living too much in the past rather than focusing on what Jackson was doing currently. I felt like we didn't get to see as much of Crenshaw as I was expecting to. I really wanted to see Jackson and Crenshaw interacting, but Crenshaw isn't as present as I was hoping, and so I didn't get invested in what was happening between them. But I did enjoy what we did get. I think that if you liked A Monster Calls, then this book has a little bit of a similar vibe. Not the same situation, but when I was reading the two, I got similar feelings about the story. So, if you liked Monster Calls, you might like this as well. I ended up giving this one three and a half stars. After that, I listened to the Mistwick School of Music Craft. This is by Jessica Corey. I do think that the audiobook is the way to go with this one. The audiobook actually came out before the physical book came out. I'm not sure if the physical book is out yet. The audiobook has like a symphony that plays all of the music that's going on, and so it makes the experience that much better. I just realized I never turned my hourglass. <laughs> the New Jersey Symphony Youth Orchestra is is phenomenal and they did a fantastic job in here and so it really brought all of those music elements to life because it's a school for people that do music and have magical music abilities it makes the book so much better being able to hear the melodies and hear the songs that they're talking about because i do not have a huge deep knowledge of music and everything like that i don't know how to play any instruments i can play hot cross buns on the recorder but that's about it. <laughs> My one negative for the audiobook was that the accents that the characters are given can be a little inconsistent. So that was a little bit of a detraction from the audiobook, but the, the orchestra made the book so much better. I haven't even talked about what this book is actually about. It follows a girl named Amelia Jones. At the beginning of the book, you find out that she has a huge passion for music craft. Her mother was one of the best music craft players, <laughs> people in the world. So she wants to follow in her mother's footsteps and attend the same academy that her mother attended. When she goes to her audition, she does not perform how she hoped that she would, and she really thinks that she botched it, but she ends up getting like a trial period at the school anyway, and so she has to prove herself to the school in order to keep her place in the most recent class at the Mistwick School of Musicraft. There's also some other nefarious things going on in the background and she's going to have to deal with those as well. And you just follow her journey as she's trying to improve in Musicraft. She's trying to make some friends at this school. She's trying to fit in. It's a fun romp. <laughs> I really had a good time while reading it. I wish we had gotten to learn a bit more about the side characters than we get in this book. This isn't a long book or anything, so there wasn't a whole bunch of space, but I think that one or two side characters could have been given a little bit more time and we would have been a bit more invested in this school as a whole instead of just invested in Amelia. For instance, there's one character who is in a wheelchair and then she's never talked about again and I really want to know what happened to that character. Like, how was she doing in this whole situation where <laughs> they have to run through the forest? Like, what is happening? <laughs> I don't know. There is a group of kids that you do learn a little bit more about, but I think it would have been nice to know a little bit more about the full cast of characters that Amelia is interacting with. Online, it said that this was a standalone. I'm not sure if it is or not. Maybe they'll expand it because I can definitely see this becoming a series. So if it does become a series, I will definitely be continuing. I gave this book like three and a half stars. The 76th book that I read in 2019 is From Here to Eternity by Caitlin Doty. If you guys don't know, Caitlin Doty is a YouTuber slash mortician. She's the channel Ask a Mortician. I watch her videos every once in a while. They are so funny. She is someone who is very death positive. She encourages people to think about death and to contemplate what they want to happen with their body after they die, having those tough conversations with people so that you know what to do when the time comes. This book is about different death practices around the globe. So Caitlin went on a journey and went to all these different countries and experienced and got to witness some death practices in other places. And then she's compiled them into this book with some commentary on how she felt and what she was doing and how the people that practice those practices felt and how they viewed her being there and all that stuff. This book is also illustrated, if I can find an illustration, so you can see that there are some illustrations in here as well. And at one point during this book, totally a side note, but it sounds like 
<laughs> Caitlin was writing with the voice of Sir David Attenborough in her head because she writes this whole scene about a whale being eaten and it sounds exactly how those nature documentaries are so i thought that was funny as well i really enjoyed this i really enjoy her channel i thought that it was really interesting to learn about different people and their different cultures and how the western society how our culture has started to infiltrate all of their traditions and have started to change them potentially for the worse for instance at some point she's in I forgot the name of the country that she was in, maybe Japan, where it, there used to be a very close interaction between a deceased person and their loved ones. Now it's become a lot more removed. Is that really a good thing? Like, Caitlin definitely prefers for families to be involved and to be close, and she definitely talks about how bodies themselves are not dangerous. And it's quite safe to take on that role and help. There are a lot of different cool things going on in this book. I definitely recommend it. I'm not going to go into all the different traditions or anything like that, but I think that it definitely added to her channel. Like there are some things that I've seen on her channel or see her talk about on her channel, but there were a lot of new things in here as well that I hadn't heard her talk about. There was definitely some new stuff in here. So I definitely recommend this one. I gave this one four stars. There's one last image and I will leave a link to her channel down in the description if you want to check her out. After that, I read The Good Luck Girls by Charlotte Nicole Davis. This is the first book in a YA fantasy ish dystopian series that follows a group of girls that are owned by a welcome house. Basically, they are forced to be at this brothel. The women and the girls that are owned by the welcome houses are given these tattoos, these magical tattoos. I believe they're called favors. These tattoos prevent them from being able to escape and live a normal life because when the tattoos are covered, they start to burn them and the pain becomes unbearable after just a short while. So they can only cover these tattoos for a very, very short time. I think maybe they're on their faces too. Like, like on their faces. Oh, there you go. See that her tattoo or her favor goes on along her neck as well as on her face. Anyway, Aster and her younger sister Clementine are owned by one of these welcome houses and Clementine is just reaching the age where she is going to be forced to start working and by working, I mean, sleep with men. Aster is not allowed to tell Clementine what is about to happen to her, but Clementine has an idea. She knows that they have to sleep with men and everything like that and be courteous and talk to them a certain way and all this stuff. When Clementine is forced into this room with this man, that is her first client. He becomes a lot more aggressive than Clementine was ready for and Clementine defends herself and ends up killing him. <laughs> and then... Clementine and Aster now need to go on the run. What ends up happening is that a few other girls tag along as well, and the five of them flee the welcome house and are running for their lives, trying to get to this mythical person that they think is able to remove their favors so that they can live normal lives. This book is described as like a Western fantasy. So they do ride around on horses. They are kind of in a lawless area. The strongest person is the one that really rules. So if you have the most power, you push everyone around and you get your own way. It's not really a place where morals are what's ruling these people. It's really just whoever has the most power. And so the girls can't really trust anyone but themselves. And really even then, can they trust all of the people within their group? I really enjoyed following this group of very strong young women who are striking out on their own, trying to defend themselves and having to, I don't know, <laughs> kind of take revenge along the way against people that have harmed them or other welcome house girls like them. I was so pleasantly surprised by this book. I enjoyed it so much. I really enjoyed following Aster as the main character. I've seen other people say that they wish that Clementine was the main character, and I definitely disagree with that. I think that Aster has the most experience other than Violet, who is one of the girls that travels with them, with these welcome houses and has really gone through the most. Aster has the biggest chip on her shoulder, maybe Violet, but Aster is the one who's going through the most and is having to balance how far she's willing to go to keep everyone alive and keep everyone together and keep everyone moving towards their goal of getting their favors removed with being 
a human and having morals <laughs> and doing the right thing. I thought she had the most complicated relationship with what the girls were doing in this book. I could totally see the series following a different character in the next book or something like that, but I think that she is the most interesting one. I think that Clementine is a very innocent character and so she's really following Aster around and is taking direction from Aster. She has things that she's going through. She is coming into her own. She's developing her own sense of morality and figuring out how she wants to go about doing things and what she wants for her life. And the other girls as well are doing similar things. Once the girls are out from under the thumb of the Welcome House, they're able to like breathe and figure out who they are and what they want. So I really enjoyed this book. I thought it was really well done. I really enjoyed all of the historical elements that Charlotte Nicole Davis was able to include in this. One of the things that Charlotte Nicole Davis was talking about when she was doing an interview that I watched was that she included a lot of historical elements. She included that a lot of the cowboys were people of color and how people don't realize how many people of color were in the Western area because it was an area that had less strict social norms and everything like that, a lot of people of color would gravitate towards these different areas. And so I thought that that was amazing. And I had not known that that was a thing because I just, <laughs> I don't read a lot of Westerns or know a lot about Western culture and like the like Wild West stuff. So I thought it was really cool. I really liked that this is based on where the author is from, like geographically. And yeah, I had a great time. I definitely want to see more people pick this book up, so I hope you guys do. I gave this one four stars, I believe. Also, the narrator for this one is very good. I switched back and forth between the audiobook and the physical book, and I really liked the audiobook as well. She does a good job of giving all of the girls very distinct voices so you can keep all the characters separate in your mind. I've heard some criticisms that a lot of the side characters sounded the same when you're reading the book, but because I was switching back and forth in my head, they had very different voices and I kept them very separate. So I've heard some people criticize that Tansy and Mallow sound quite similar. It, to me, they didn't, so pick this one up. <laughs> and the last book that I read in 2019 was A Dog's Way Home by W. Bruce Cameron. This is the same author who wrote A Dog's Purpose. I'm pretty sure this book also got turned into a movie. I have not watched A Dog's Way Home yet. This is a book where I do think that the blurb ruins the book almost. The blurb of the book covers so much of this book. It was very frustrating to read because I think like the first 150 or almost 200 pages are the blurb. It takes that long to get past all of the stuff that you know is about to happen and then all you get is the last like hundred-ish pages of stuff that you didn't know was already going to happen. So it's not a very fun read if you've read the blurb, so don't read the blurb. It is about a dog named Bella, and at the beginning of the book, she's taken in by this guy. Her owner ends up making some of the animal control people in their town very angry. They have a bit of a rivalry where Bella's owner is preventing these real estate developers from developing and knocking down these houses that house a lot of stray animals in them. These few animal control people are corrupt. They end up going head to head, and Bella is caught in between. That's all you need to know. I don't think that you need to know any more than that so that you can experience the story without knowing too much. Once I got past the stuff that I knew, I did really enjoy the story. I thought that Bella had a lot of varied experiences. I really enjoyed seeing where she went. And I also really appreciated that once Bella experienced something and then was onto something new, she would think about something that would happen in the past once something reminded her of it. You kind of like have hints back at what she's already been through and how she feels about it and how she relates it to what she's going through now. So I thought it was really well done. I'm not sure exactly how dogs think. I haven't really read up on that, but I thought that it was enjoyable and I enjoyed seeing Bella's journey unfold. It's also one of those books that might make you mad because obviously Bella is caught in between her owner and the people that are going against her owner. They don't treat her very nicely, or some people don't treat her very nicely. There are some people that love Bella and treat her like the queen that she is, but if people treating dogs poorly is going to make you angry, like it is supposed to in this book, know that going in, there is a very good ending. I will say that it's a positive ending. <laughs> the ending is not going to make you mad or sad or anything like that. Just know that. <laughs> I ended up giving this book three and a half stars because personally it was a slog to get through all of the information that was covered in the blurb. Again, I know I'm saying that a million times, but the portion that I read at the very end made up for it a little bit. So I ended up enjoying this again. 
three and a half stars. So those are all the books that I read in 2019. At least those are the last eight books that I read in 2019. If you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up and comment down below what was the last book that you read this past year now. Anything else you want me to know, leave it down below and I will talk to you guys next time.